Okay, this is a run through of the 2009 Maths Methods Exam 1. Um, as always, if you have any questions or if you find a mistake, just leave a comment. Uh, so here we go, question 1. This is a straight product rule question. Uh, so if we differentiate x, we get 1, leave log x the same, plus leave x the same and differentiate log, which is 1 on x. So that gives us our log of x plus x on x, which simplifies to log of x plus 1. You note I've got d dx here, not dy dx. There's been no y introduced in the question, so we'll just write d dx. All right, part b, using the quotient rule, uh, f dash of x, here's v du dx minus u times dv dx over v squared. Uh, sub in pi and simplify, we get 2 on 2 pi plus 2 all squared. I wouldn't try expanding that. It's not going to make your answer any simpler, so we'll just leave it there, and that should get us the three marks. Moving on, find an antiderivative of 1 on 1 minus 2x. So uh, using the proper notation, uh, we'll take out a negative 1 on 2 out the front, and we'll write log of 1 minus 2x, uh, not forgetting our modular signs. You notice I don't have a plus c here. It's not needed, seeing as we've been asked for an antiderivative. Pretty straightforward question. Moving on, we need to find uh, evaluate a definite integral. So if we anti-differentiate what's inside the brackets there, we get 2 on 3 x to the 3 on 2 plus x. Um, with our terminals of 4 and 1. If we sub all of that in, being careful to use lots of brackets so uh, we don't muck up any of the negatives. Uh, we get um, also, once we sub in 4 to the 3 on 2, probably the easiest way to do that is to rewrite it as 4 to the half to the power of 3. So 4 to the half is 2, to the power of 3 is 8. So that's where our 16 on 3 has come from. Um, put everything over a common denominator, simplify, we get 23 over 3. Okay, next question, we're asked to find an inverse function. So our original function is f of x is equal to 3 on x minus 4. Uh, if we're going to swap x and y around and solve for y, because there's been no y introduced in the question, we should let f of x equal y, and then write that we're going to swap x and y. So that gives us x is equal to 3 on y minus 4. We rearrange that, we get y is equal to 3 on x plus 4. Now be careful because we've been asked to find the inverse function of x. Because we've been asked to define a function, we need to include its domain. So the domain of the in inverse function is the range of the original function, which is uh, all real numbers except for negative 4. So if we define our inverse function here, f to the negative 1 of x is equal to 3 on x plus 4 comma, where x is an element of all real numbers except for negative 4. And then we've answered the question. All right, moving on. Um, a trig equation, we need to solve tan of 2x is equal to the square root of 3, uh, where x is an element of this kind of strange domain here. Um, if we're not too worried about that, if we just solve the function, so um, tan of pi on 3 is root 3, so that gives me my first solution. We have another one at 4 pi on 3, and then maybe we'll go uh, back the other way as well, uh, get a couple of negative solutions just in case. That gives us negative 5 pi on 3 and negative 2 pi on 3. Uh, if we divide all our answers by 2, that gives us pi on 6, 4 pi on 6, negative 5 pi on 6, negative 2 pi on 6. Those solutions are outside our domain, so we're left with these two solutions. Uh, just with our first line, Really, you can find as many solutions as you want. Um, so you're probably always better off finding some extra ones and then crossing them off at the end uh, rather than ending up with a with an incomplete solution. All right, question five. We're now moving into some probability. This question was pretty straightforward. Uh, we've got four balls in a box, one, two, three, and four. If we draw out two balls without replacement, What's the probability that the first one is 4, the second one's 1? That's just going to be a quarter times a third, which is 1 on 12. Um, whereas the probability that the sum of the numbers and the two balls is 5, well, there's two ways and that can happen. We can get a 1 and a 4 or a 2 and a 3, um, but taking into account that it could be 1 and 4 or 4 then 1, um, we just double that probability. So 
um, the probability of this happening is 1 on 12 and this happening is 1 on 12 so that gives us 2 on 12 times 2 is 4 on 12 which is 1 on 3. Don't forget to simplify your answers here or you won't get the mark. Alright, finally, given that the sum of the numbers on the two balls is 5, what's the probability that the second ball is a number 1? So uh, the word given there is a, uh, tells you that we're looking at conditional probability here. So it's the probability that the second ball is a 1, given that the sum of the two balls is 5. So the formula for conditional probability would state that that would be the intersection of those two things divided by the probability that the sum of the two balls is 5. So if the second ball is 1 and the sum of the two balls is 5, then that has to that can only happen uh, when the first ball is a 4 and the second ball is a 1. So the probability of that is 1 on 12. And we just worked out that the probability that the sum of two balls being 5 is 1 on 3. So 1 on 12 divided by 1 on 3 is 3 on 12, which is 1 quarter. Okay, question six, here we have a related rates question. So the easiest way to do this, we're talking about uh, volume, we're talking about radius, and we're talking about time. So I always like to start by writing dv dt is equal to dv dr times dr dt. You know you're right if uh, these two things match up and the dv and the dt should be the same as what you've got over here. So that looks like a, it looks like a chain rule. So dv dr is going to be uh, 4 pi r, which is what happens if we differentiate 2 pi r squared, we get 4 pi r. So if we sub what we know into this formula, we get 10 is equal to 4 pi r times dr dt, which is what the question is asking us to find, the rate of change of the radius um, when the radius is 30 millimeters. So solve for dr dt, you get 10 on 4 pi r, which is 5 on 2 pi r. Then if we sub 30 into that, we get 5 on 60 pi which simplifies to 1 on 12 pi millimetres per minute. Uh, you have been asked for an exact answer with units of millimetres per minute, so make sure we um, write that out properly. Question 7, we're back to probability again. We've got a probability distribution where x can take the values of 0, 1, 2, 3 or 4, and we are uh, told the probability of each of those things. And again, we have another conditional probability question. So the probability that x is greater than 1, given that it's less than or equal to 3, is um, the same as the probability x is greater than 1 and is also less than or equal to 3, divided by the probability x is less than or equal to 3. So the probability x is greater than 1 and less than or equal to 3 is going to be the probability that it is either 2 or 3, which is 0.4 plus 0.2, divided by 0.9 gives us 0.6 over 0.9, which uh, simplifies to 2 on 3. Part B, find the variance. This is um, a bit of a, um, a long question to work out, but it's still following the simple formula. So the variance of x is given by the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x all squared. So um, that gives us, just scrolling back up here, so the first one, the expectation of x squared, that's given by that squared times that plus that squared times that plus that squared times that plus that squared times that and so on so um, zero squared is just zero and one squared is just one so we end up with um, one times 0 0.2 which is 0 0.2 plus four times 0 0.4 plus nine times 0 0.2 and so on and if we find e of x squared which is the same thing except um, we don't square these first numbers um, but we do square the whole thing at the end. Um, so being careful to multiply our decimals correctly, if we simplify here, this bit just ended up being two. So that gave us four and this became 5.2. We end up with 1.2 as our answer. Okay, question eight. Um, you'll find a similar question as the last question on the 2010 or 11 paper, I think, I'm not sure which. Um, so we've got a function f of x is equal to e to the x plus k. The tangent to the graph of f at the point where x is equal to a passes through the origin. So find k in terms of a. So the easiest way to, to really do this one was to just start subbing in things really. So um, f of a is e to the a plus k. If we differentiate f of x, we get e to the x. And if we sub a into that, 
we get e to the a. So we know that the y coordinate where x is equal to a, the y coordinate is e to the a plus k, and we know that the gradient at that point is e to the a. So that gives us enough information to find the equation of the tangent. So if we use the formula y minus y1 equals mx minus x1, and we sub in our y coordinate here and our x coordinate here and our gradient here, that actually gives us the equation of the tangent at the point where x equals a. The extra bit of information we were told was that that tangent that we just found the equation of passes through the point zero, zero. So we can actually sub in zero, zero into here because we know that this line goes through zero, zero. So if we do that, we end up with e to the, uh, sorry, negative e to the a minus k equals e to the a times negative a. And then we can simply rearrange and solve for k, which gives us this. And if we want to factorize that, we can. Question nine, uh, a straightforward uh, log equation, really not too difficult. Uh, if we start by taking the two up, uh, we get log of x squared minus log of x plus three. Uh, you could take this over to the left hand side if you want, but I wouldn't bother. I'd just put these two logs together, you get that. And then we can drop our logs giving us x squared on x plus three is equal to a half. So take the two to the left, take the x plus three to the right, we get two x squared equals x plus three. Take everything to the left, factorize and solve. We get x is equal to three on two or x is equal to negative one. Now x can't be negative one uh, because x is gonna have to be greater than zero. Otherwise uh, this equation here will be undefined. So we need to cross out this solution and write why we've crossed it out. And um, that just leaves us with the one solution of x is equal to three on two. Make sure when you're doing this, we do write all of the solutions and then cross out the ones that aren't needed. Um, otherwise you haven't uh, explored all of the possible solutions and you're not technically correct. Okay, question 10, uh, we've got a um, linear approximation question. So we're given the formula here, which should make it a little bit easier. So using the, the relationship f of x plus h is approximately equal to, um, to this. For a small value of h, find an approximate value for the cube root of 8.06. So the first thing you should do is we're gonna decide what the function is actually going to be. So it's obviously just gonna be the cube root of x where um, we're going to use um, eight as x and h is going to be 0 0.06. So plugging all of that into the formula, we end up uh, with f of eight plus 0 0.06 to the f dash of eight. If you differentiate the function, um, it's uh, one on three x to the negative two on three. So sub everything in, you get the cube root of eight plus six on a hundred times one on three times eight to the negative two on three. I uh, just changed the 0.06 to 6 over 100 here because I knew I was going to be working with fractions. Just make it a little bit easier. 8 to the negative 2 on 3 is uh, 1 quarter. Uh, so if we simplify all of this, we end up with 401 over 200, making sure we use these approximate signs the whole way down. And the very last question was um, quite a difficult one to explain. Uh, I think probably the easiest way to do it is just to draw a picture. So what we're trying to show is that what we just worked out, the 401 over 200 is actually larger than what the cube root of 8.06 actually is. So if you draw what the cube root of X looks like and you show that the tangent at the point uh, eight um, is, is here. So this should actually be an 8.06, I've just realized. Um, so we're trying to show that this point here, which is the 401 over two is bigger than this point here. So what you're really saying in, in words is that the gradient of the function is positive, but it's decreasing. So the gradient of the function is positive, but the gradient's getting smaller as we go along here. So that means that the point on the tangent is going to be larger than the point on the actual graph. So if you can explain that in, in some way that made sense mathematically then then you may have gotten the mark um, but I looks from the examiner's report looks like not many people did so quite a difficult question so that's the end of the exam uh, like I said if you got any questions or if you want to leave a uh, if you find a mistake just leave a comment I do recommend you have a look at the examiner's report for this exam as well uh, as that'll give you a, a better idea uh, if you're sitting the methods exam this year best of luck and um, I hope you do well